their children and also vulnerable families. At this time on GRPS. Welcome back to GRTS News to News Outside the Gambia now. The presidents of North and South Sudan have met on the fringes of the African Union summit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to diffuse tensions between the two countries. Their meeting comes as African leaders express concern over the conflicts ravaging the continent. The leaders deplored the crisis in the Congo and Mali and called for a speedy restoration of state authority in the affected areas. One by one, heads of state and government arrived to take part in the African Union's 19th summit. On the discussion table today are hot topics such as Mali, which has already been much debated during preparation meetings. The African Union finds it difficult to hide its impatience as the transition process proves to be slow. It's calling for a government of national unity, which it believes is the only way to face Islamist insurgents who've taken control of the north of Mali. The crisis in Mali is certainly the worst crisis for the African continent. The coup is very dangerous for Mali's livelihood. The Great Lake region is also high up on the agenda with fresh violence in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Kinshasa is accusing neighboring Rwanda of helping M23 rebels. Kigali has denied this. The African Union wants to appease tensions and says it's ready to contribute to peace forces in the region so as to counter armed groups. AU's support to the efforts to fully restore state authority over the concerned areas. The African Union is backing efforts to restore state authority in the affected areas. Another more positive topic of discussion for the AU summit is the meeting between Omar al-Bashir and Salva Kiir. After months of tensions and clashes on the border, the Sudanese and South Sudanese heads of states have met and shaken hands. <laughs> The UN observer mission in Syria has confirmed that an alleged massacre in the Syrian village of Tremse targeted the homes of opposition fighters and army deserters. This follows claims by anti-Assad groups that the Syrian army used tanks and army helicopters to bombard villages, killing more than 130 civilians, most of them women and children. We have more in this report. After going to Tremse in a convoy, UN observers said that the violence there had targeted the homes of Syrian army deserters and opposition activists. The UN observers said that various types of weaponry had been used during the clashes. We are in uh, Tremse now. We entered today at 8.30 in the morning. We're continuing to verify the facts. We can confirm that there was a military operation on July 12th on Thursday. Uh, the attacks appeared targeted towards specific homes. Uh, of the uh, activists as well as, ar as army defectors. The UN observers were not obliged to request special authorization to go to Tramse and try to determine exactly what happened there. Are these Kofi Annan's and the Security Council's reforms? And Ahmadinejad and Lavrov and Boutaine Shaban and Walid Mualem and the traitor Manif Tias? The Syrian government says that there was no massacre there. It denies that it used tanks and helicopters during military operations in Tremse. Government forces did not use planes or helicopters or tanks or artillery. Everything that was said about using artillery to attack a one-kilometer sized village is not true. It is difficult to get a clear picture of the situation, but the ongoing violence did result in at least 115 deaths on Saturday. South. The opening of NATO supply routes in Pakistan has angered people as thousands take to the streets, demanding the closure of the routes. Hundreds of protesters in Saudi Arabia's Shiite provinces have been calling for the release of a Shiite cleric arrested by authorities there. And in the U.S., the Green Party has unveiled its challenger to the mainstream Democratic and Republican candidates in the November race for the White House job. For more on those stories and others, we go with this roundup. Thousands of people came out to demonstrate in Peshawar, Pakistan, in the north near the border with Afghanistan. They protested against the reopening of supply lines for U.S.-led NATO forces in Afghanistan. The supply routes were closed for seven months after a NATO airstrike killed 24 Pakistani soldiers in November. 
In southern Pakistan, in the city Quetta, religious groups also protested. The Defense of Pakistan Council, comprised of 40 religious groups, planned to march to the border town Chaman in protest over the reopening of the supply lines. This amateur video footage shows a police station on fire in Awamiya in eastern Saudi Arabia as police cars rush to the scene. The footage cannot be independently verified. Four people attacked the police station. They opened fire and one of the attackers threw a firebomb at the station. The police shot and killed one of the men. The eastern province is predominantly Shiite Muslim, while the country has a Sunni majority. Earlier this week, two men were killed in eastern province during protest after the arrest of a Shiite cleric. Kurdish protesters and police clashed in the southeastern city of Diyar Pakir on Saturday. The protesters are calling for the release of the leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, Abdullah Okulan. Police fired water cannons and tear gas at protesters when hundreds of demonstrators clashed with security forces using sticks and stones. Around 20 people were wounded, including a pro-Kurdish deputy. The Kurdistan Workers' Party want to create a separate, independent Kurdish state. Stein is running against U.S. President Barack Obama and his Republican rival Mitt Romney in the presidential election. In the United States, there aren't only the Republican and Democratic parties. There is also the Green Party, and Jill Stein is their candidate. 62-year-old Stein is a doctor. She intends to make the Green Party's voice heard. In political debate in the United States, the Green Party is marginalized. But now, Stein looks set to be on the voting ballot in every state by election time. And there uh, we're going to take a second break. We'll take a look at the sport in just a moment. It's traditional that your national GSM provider, Gamsel, takes many of its valuable customers to make each year. This year again, Gamsel will offer 10 more of its valuable customers a complete hide package in a draw to be held live on GRTS television. Yes, your hide is possible by simply loading $50 his credit card or no power. You can win not only a return ticket to Mecca, but also $1,000 travel allowance, food and accommodation in Medina and Mecca. Remember, the more you load $50 his credit card or no power, the more you increase your winning chance. With Gamsel, your hide is now easier. Gamsel, yeah, but on. Welcome back to the news and Welcome back to GRT's News and to the sports. Now, the Olympic Games have always had a special significance for different reasons and for so many different people as well over the years. Where London 2020 comes around later this month, poignant events from 56 years ago will come flooding back. CNN's Alex Wolf reports. It's late October 1956 and there's unrest in Hungary. The people have risen up against the country's Soviet-backed government. Bullets fill the streets. And I heard, you know, you heard the bullets flying above your head. It was already in full swing. People running around with guns, a few people hung, hanged. Amidst the smoke and gunfire, Laszlo Tabori, Nick Martin, and Joe Gerlach have a different mission. They and their teammates prepare to leave for the Summer Olympics in Australia. Despite the chaos, Hungarian Olympic officials have vowed to send a team. So this is the bus that took you yeah. out of Budapest? Yeah, and they put the Olympic rings on it. They know so it's the Olympia, not the troublemakers. We bypassed many uh, uh, Russian uh, blocks. You know, they blocked the street. We decided, hell, we will represent the devil himself just to get out of there. When the team left for the games, it seemed the popular uprising had successfully overthrown the communist government. The athletes thought they'd left a newly free Hungary. Only upon arriving in Australia did it become clear the revolution had been crushed. Now, as the Olympians were marching in Melbourne, Soviet troops were marching in Budapest. 
the full extent of what happened back home? Was it still a mystery, or how did Absolutely. you? Absolutely. We had.